And good morning, everyone. Happy Tuesday morning. Welcome back to Morning Musings. My name is Don K. Preston. I'm the president of Preterist Research Institute of Ardmore, Oklahoma. I really do appreciate you being with me, okay? Okay, now, <clears throat> I told you yesterday morning I was going to uh, make a very special book offer for the month of March. Now, this is, this is U.S. orders only. I, I'm, I apologize. I cannot do this for out-of-country orders. If you are in Canada, Mexico, the Philippines, or uh, Pakistan, or Asia, or whatever, if you wish to purchase PDF copies uh, of this order or of this offer, then contact me, and I will try to help you out with a greatly reduced price on certain conditions. Uh, but the offer, okay. Since what we are looking at, the promise of the new heaven and new earth, in Matthew chapter 25, 31 and following, are so interrelated. You know, you cannot talk about Matthew chapter 25, 31 and following without talking about the new heaven and new earth, and therefore talking about the old heaven and earth passing away. Now, I've written a book entitled, The Element Shall Melt with Fer Fervent Heat. I do not know of another book like this. Pardon me. To my knowledge, this is the only, the first and the only, full preterist commentary on 2 Peter chapter 3. It is extremely exhaustive. It is comprehensive. It goes from the Old Testament to Revelation. And it demonstrates that what Peter was predicting and thus what Matthew 25, 31 and following was predicting was absolutely not the end of time and the destruction of material creation. Now, this book, and what happens an awful lot of time is there are many commentators, particularly in the post-millennial world, they tell us, well, yeah, you know, uh, 2 Peter chapter 3 was definitely fulfilled in AD 70, but of course, everyone knows, we are assured, that uh, AD 70 was just a type and a shadow of the real day of the Lord, the real end of the age. As I have pointed out, that is Steve Gregg's position that he iterates on pages uh, 86 and 87 of his book. AD 70 was just a type and a shadow of the real thing. Well, if you were to purchase each one of these books separately, it would cost you $87, including shipping, okay? But for the rest of March 2023, U.S. orders only, total delivered price to your door, not another dime, $32.50. That's going to save you $50. $15 and a few cents, okay? This is a fantastic offer. So do not fail to take advantage of it. Go to my website, donkpreston.com or bibleprophecy.com. My webmaster will have a banner right up at the very top. Uh, all you have to do is click on it, follow the link, and you'll be able to get this book, uh, or get these books at this really significantly excellent price. Don't fail to take advantage of it. You'll be glad you got these books. Like I said, folks, this is I, both of these books are unprecedented, all right? I'm not aware of any other books out there that cover the topics covered in these books in the manner that they do. So again, take advantage of that. Okay, so what I've been sharing with you over the last little bit, we've been focused on Isaiah chapter 65, and the promise of the new heaven and new earth, because Matthew chapter 25, 31 and following, everyone agrees is the coming of the Lord for the new heaven and new earth. Now, make, make no mistake, the commentators are virtually unanimous. Some disagree, not many, but the commentators are virtually unanimous in agreeing that the promise of the new heaven and new earth and yes, I understand Matthew 25, 31 and following doesn't use the term new heaven and new earth. Uses the term kingdom. 
And that's what the new heaven and new earth is all about. But I digress. What the commentators, as I have pointed out repeatedly, what the commentators absolutely fail to honor, whether through simple oversight, and by the way, I'm not accusing anyone of dishonesty, of insincerity. Now, look, we're all human beings. We are all subject to error. We just have to be willing to rethink. We have to be willing to examine our traditions and our prejudices and, yes, the creeds to see if they agree. And I find it ironic <clears throat> that one of the charges against covenant eschatology is it's not in the creeds. Well, that's true. And thus the argument is made, well, if it's not in the creeds, it must be wrong. It has to be wrong. We have to reject it. Now, the irony here, of course, is uh, many of those who make those arguments, men such as Kenneth Gentry, don't have any problem whatsoever in violating the creeds. Kenneth Gentry, in his book, The Beast of Revelation, and of course, implicitly in his book, Before Jerusalem Fell, but in his book, The Beast of Revelation, Kenneth Gentry openly admits that the views that he, was, that he sets forth in that book are not to be found in history. They're not part of tradition. Oh, and they're not part of the creeds. But he said, he asks our patience. He asks for our understanding because he says he believes that the evidence is like an overflowing river in abundance. Well, I happen to agree with them on, on that, on the dating of Revelation. Now, <clears throat> the question, therefore, is if, uh, if we don't have a problem, whoever we are, with differing with the creed over here, and by the way, by the way, the Westminster Confession of Faith identifies the man of sin as the Roman Catholic Church. How many of my Reformed friends who are watching accept that position now. Kenneth Gentry actually goes into detail explaining why he rejects that eschatology of Westminster Confession of Faith. Well, you know, they took that position because they were in the midst of controversy with the Catholic Church. Uh, it was, that, that position was not carefully exeg uh, or the result of careful exegesis, etc., 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 Bingo. So once again, if you're willing to differ with the creeds on this point and that point, not minor points, by the way, massive, major, fundamental points, then why not be willing to reexamine the entire question of eschatology as presented in the creeds in light of the you know, river overflowing with evidence concerning when the Lord was supposed to come. And so my challenge, my request of all of those who put so much reliance on <clears throat> tradition and history and the creeds, to take a careful look and to once again, to reiterate, ask yourself, if you're willing to reject a creed here and here and here, why not be willing to go ahead and re-examine the entire question of eschatology? My friend Mike Sullivan, with whom I have worked closely on different occasions, has just written a response. You know, a group of, quote, orthodox partial preterists who, as Mike Sullivan points out, you got to go Mike Sullivan's uh, Facebook page and read his response. Absolutely outstanding. But as Mike points out, guess what? All of the 
what happened was this entire group of partial preterists drafted a letter demanding that Gary DeMar answer their questions. Because after all, Gary DeMar has had the temerity to quote the Westminster Confession of Faith that says the scriptures are the ultimate and final authority in all matters. And if if the Westminster Confession of Faith is found to be wrong in light of Scripture, we are duty-bound to accept Scripture. My goodness, how could Gary DeMar have the temerity to do that? No, let's turn that around. How could all of these men, and as I started to say, Mike Sullivan has pointed out that every single one of those men who signed that letter have differences sometimes massive differences between themselves on certain major eschatological texts. As an illustration, Sam Frost says that 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 applies to, uh, applied to Christ's ascension, that the Thessalonians were to take comfort in the fact not that Christ was coming to give them relief, from their then ongoing persecution, but rather they were to look back at the ascension and go, oh my goodness, we're just so comforted by the fact that Jesus ascended to the Father in Acts chapter 1. Well, Kenneth Gentry absolutely, totally rejects that. And says, no, 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 no. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 is the end of time. Folks, this is no minor disagreement. So, again, Mike Sullivan does a great job of illustrating that all of these men, even though they categorically disagree with one another on major eschatological texts, they are demanding that Gary DeMar answer their questions. But will they answer, have they answered questions that, that have been and are being posed to them, number one, by Gary DeMar, number two, by Mike Sullivan and his co-writers entitled A Reformed Response to Partial Preterism. I sell the book on my website. You can contact me for a copy of that book. And so Mike Sullivan points out, guess what? These very men who are demanding answers from Gary DeMar, they will not, they continue to refuse to answer questions from other partial preterists and especially from full preterists. Guess what? I have personally challenged Kenneth Gentry to formally meet, to meet me in formal public debate or written debate no less than 15, probably 20 times. And you know, he just can't find the time to do it. Listen, Gary DeMar even offered to pay some of these men, one of these men, to meet a full preterist in a formal written debate. Said he'd pay the price. I volunteered. I'll be more than happy to engage in this debate. But guess what? Not one of them. Not. Do you catch the power of this, ladies and gentlemen? They're demanding that Gary DeMar answer their questions, but they absolutely, totally, categorically refuse to answer the questions of full preterists. That's a little bit revealing, it seems to me. But guess what? I'm out of time. <laughs> okay, got on my soapbox a little bit here, but this is really, really important. So what we're going to do tomorrow is we're going to begin an examination of Isaiah 66. Because Isaiah 66, just like Isaiah 65, serves as the foundational source, the fountain, if you please, for the New Testament doctrine of the new heaven and the new earth. So in other words, when Peter in 2 Peter chapter 3 said, according to his promise, we are looking for the new heaven and new earth, he was appealing to Isaiah 65 as well as Isaiah chapter 66. But Isaiah 65 and 66, we've already seen that in chapter 65, but Isaiah chapter 66 
predicted the coming of the new heaven and new earth, just like Isaiah 65 did at the time of the destruction of Old Covenant Israel. Since Matthew 25, 31 and following is a prediction of the coming of the Lord at the time of the bringing in of the new heaven and new earth being anticipated by Peter in 2 Peter chapter 3, and since 2 Peter chapter 3 was anticipating the coming of the Lord of Isaiah 65 and Isaiah chapter 66 to bring in the new creation at the time of the destruction of the old covenant temple, then guess what? That means Matthew 25, 31 and following would, was to be and was fulfilled at the time of the destruction of the Old Covenant Temple in A.D. 70. Okay, out of time. Don't forget, total delivered price, U.S. orders only. The elements shall melt with fervent heat and A.D. 70, a shadow of the real end. Go to my website, donkpreston.com, bibleprophecy.com, and order the books. Like I said, you'll be really, really glad you did. All right, I'll see you on the flip side.